What's up, folks? Happy Friday. You're listening to the Entrepreneurial Web. Again, I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox. Today, we're Zooming live from Brooklyn, but also from Santee, California, just outside of San Diego. Before I bring my hot fire fighter guest on today, the message of the week. This is actually in his bio on his Instagram handle. Heard this many times, and it's one of my favorite quotes by Bruce Lee. I fear not the man that has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. The world is turned sideways, upside down, constantly shifting. And that's the mentality. You have to have that razor sharp focus today. We're going to talk to my guest about setting some super high goals and how that razor sharp focus will get you there with that. I would like to welcome to the show, Jeff, the administrator, Peterson. Woo! <laughs> that was, that was my wild. best Bruce buffer. Is that right? <laughs> Has Bruce ever called you in before? No, I wish. That's yeah, not, yeah. That's, one that's day. Cool, one day. That's what we're here to talk about. So Jeff is uh, he's a professional MMA fighter. He is also the head instructor at uh, Alliance something. At, what is it? Alliance something East. You got to tell me. Center East. Um, and is this like Alliance, like Fabio Gergel Alliance? Um, I I do not think so. There's a lot of gyms called Alliance. Just in San Diego, there's there's quite a few. Um, yeah. Do you know uh, Fabio Gergel? I do not. He's so he's these days the um, the head of Alliance Jiu Jitsu. Okay. Which is a franchise. The, the one that's got like the logo is like a like a triangle with like a bird. Oh, yeah, there, that, that sounds about right. <laughs> There is about right. Quite a um, few uh, alliance jujitsu's out here. Yeah, yeah. I, especially you're you're not far from San Diego, correct? Yeah, this is we're we're in San Diego County. It's like the city's yeah. like 20, 25 minutes. Gotcha. Um, yeah, we're just like the the uh, domestic jujitsu uh, mecca, right? Like nationally, there's probably more gyms headquartered in San Diego uh, jujitsu gyms than just about anything else anywhere else, right? Yeah, there's a lot of gyms here for sure. A lot, a lot of gyms. There's, I stay pretty, pretty tight with the the gym community and the fight community. And there's every tournament or competition I go to, there's always gyms popping up that I didn't even know. Right. Know so um, Marcelo Garcia uh, is an Alliance student. Like that's he came up in the Alliance system. And even uh, I had a gentleman on the show, uh, Matthias Lutes, back in June or July. And he, he's a Marcelo black belt here in New York. And he opened a gym in Long Island. And it's a Marcelo affiliate. But he was explaining the whole franchise structure in jiu-jitsu schools, which I was completely oblivious to. Um, I didn't even know that existed uh, as a business model. And he was saying they, they fell under the alliance umbrella. That's what I was curious uh, but if, if the name Fabio Gergel does not ring a bell to you, it's likely not. <laughs> you would you would know. No, he yeah. had a, do you know the wrestler uh, Mark Kerr? Are you familiar I've with heard him? The, I've heard the name. I can't I I can't think of who that is off the top of my head. He literally he looks like the Hulk. Like yeah. if the Hulk wasn't green, that's what he would be. Mark Kerr. He's massive. He, he was you know he was active maybe like 20, 25 years ago, and he had this epic fight. Uh, it was probably, I don't, I want to say it was in Brazil. It was a Vale Tudo. They were in a ring, uh -huh. no gloves, bare knuckles, anything goes, headbutts, everything. Yeah. Um, and it was an, an elimination night, you know, the way they used to do it, like early UFC. So these guys would fight like three, four times a night. And they yeah. got down to the final battle. And it was Kerr and Fabio Vergel. And Kerr was like an easy hundred pounds heavier than him. And this was my introduction to Fabio Vergel. I didn't know who he was at the time. This is probably like his prime. And they went 30 minutes and it was one of the most brutal <laughs> bare knuckle fights I've ever seen. Like Mark Kerr head butted one of Fabio Gergel's teeth out of the ring. Like it just like his tooth just shot out from a headbutt. Mark Kerr's hand was broken. You could just see it. His hand was just totally swollen. So he couldn't punch with that. I mean, it was, it was like serious. You should look this fight up. I'll, I could, I'll find the link and send it to you. Uh, maybe after the show It's like, when I saw that, I was like, yeah, whoa, yeah, I, I just started jujitsu and I was yeah. like, that can happen. Like this happens. <laughs> it's insane. Combat, combat. I mean, jujitsu was, was originally a, 
uh, a combat sport. I mean, arguably the first real, like, aside from Bale Tudo, the, yeah. the first combat kind of test yourself, test martial arts against other martial arts. You know, the Gracies had that, that open door policy of uh, you can walk into their school and, and choose which one of our black belts you want to fight. Tough dudes, tough dudes. <laughs> so you're a tough dude too. You are a Marine, Try to correct? Be. That's correct. That's correct. I did uh, four years from 2008 to 2012. And then, uh, then I got out and moved out to California to live the dream. And, and you and I connected uh, through my brother. He actually was a training partner of yours and uh, even cornered a fight in like a was it like a, a roller rink or something in Pennsylvania? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a, a a good story. I actually the first time I I met your your brother Jake, it's at it was uh it wasn't at the gym. It was actually at a bar that I was bouncing at. Yeah, like big surprise, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's where I met him. Yeah, I saw but, him. I saw him shadow boxing in front of some table while fights were going on, and I was like, <laughs> "Who is this d bag shadow what's boxing? this fool doing?" <laughs> front of all these average people like I could tell he was the the expert at the table you know and then uh and then we started BSing and then before you know it we were uh we were training together and then he uh he actually helped me out a lot with my wrestling back then he was uh coaching a high school team so he'd bring me to the high school and have me wrestle all of his right. stuff so yeah um and uh you, oh, you said so. Oh, I was going to say, um, you know, like all these New York guys, too, especially uh, a lot of the instructor, instructors at Henzo's flagship academy here in New York City, they were all, it was the same for them. They were all bouncers. They were yep. all just like New York City bouncers, like John Danaher, who's like one of the most sought after jujitsu instructors in the world now. He was a bouncer. And this guy came to him in like the late 90s and was like, or like mid 95 or whatever. And he was like, I just tried, I just learned this new thing. Like it might help you bouncing. And he's like, it was a little guy, you know, and he was like, yeah, what are you going to show me? And he, he, the guy was like, give me in a, in a, in a bulldog choke and like a front headlock. And he was like, all right. He was like, I'm going to get out. Dan Hurst, like twice the guy's size. He's like, yeah, whatever. And the dude slipped out and took his back. And he was like, holy shit. So he, he started training. And then even more recently, I think it was a guy I had on the show uh, a couple months ago, basically a bunch of Henzo's cousins were at a bar, you know, got rowdy bouncers got involved a fight broke out and this one bouncer just like schooled them all and they they came back like a few days later and the bouncer's like oh shit these guys are gonna fuck me up and they were like henzo wants to see you he wants you to teach us all what you did to us. <laughs> so the bouncer community definitely like there's a big connection between the bouncer community and and grappling instructors and and martial artists yeah it's pretty in, crazy in martial arts in general when uh when I first came out here, I met quite a few guys that were, that were bouncers. That was kind of how they were, uh, they were on that fighter schedule. Cause in professional fighting, a lot of the guys train in the morning. So they're, they're at the gym that whole, that whole morning. And I, when I first came out here, I always wondered, I was like, what do these guys do for work? Like, how are they all here able to train all the time during the day? Like this is normal people working time. And they're all like, Oh yeah, I work at the hard rock or I bounce over here. And, like okay that makes sense well, and you get to practice at night too <laughs> yeah yeah hopefully hopefully not i never had to uh i never had to wrestle jacob out of the bar luckily so yeah that would it would have been a tough one it would have been a tough tough pitch to catch yeah um so you're a native of wisconsin is that correct yep yep i'm from uh ashland wisconsin it's way way up north right on uh the bay of lake superior it's mm -hmm. a very it's a very cold place Cold, yeah, nice and cold out there. And and you ended up in Virginia through the military. Yep, yep. I got I got stationed in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Mm. So I was there. I did. Pro I was probably there about close to four years in all. Yeah, that's a classic stint for military there. I remember. Um, and you also uh, have a ISSA sports nutrition certification. Oh yeah, yeah. I got that that a long time ago. Um, that was, uh, I did quite a bit of research and study just for myself on uh, just how to cut weight more effectively. That was a, originally why I got a nutrition certification was, was just for my own personal knowledge. I wanted to, 
be like, how can I perform better? How can I do these big weight cuts and bounce back better? And then, uh, and then also just as a result, it helps me uh, with my training. You know, I yeah. train, I train myself, I train people, I train mm -hmm. regular people, I train other fighters. So just having that, that little bit of uh, nutritional knowledge is definitely helpful. So currently you're, you're, you're still an active fighter. You're still an active competitor. You're teaching, you're the head, the head coach at Alliance and you do uh, some personal training as well. Yes. Yes. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm at the gym all day. I'm at the gym all day. Yeah, no, that's great. Is there anything I missed in terms of just like your, your kind of like workflow and, and like sources of income? Uh, for the most part, it's, it's uh, just the gym and, and martial arts. I wouldn't quite consider my, <clears throat> my pro fighting career as a source of income yet. Gotcha. <laughs> most, uh, a lot of pro fighters know that, that fighting isn't the greatest source of income. Well, my brother and I, you know, with our, our weekly little uh, show that we've been doing, uh, this came up a couple of weeks ago, um, particularly uh, because of an interview I saw with Ben Askren and John Danaher, and, and they were talking about just the grappling scene in terms of uh, the way the events are going right now. And uh, they were talking about certain um, elite grapplers who had talked about making the transition to MMA in the hopes of, you know, more financial freedom. But at this point, it looks like the grappling event, <laughs> like, like, I like how you laugh. I mean, this was Dan Hur's basic thing because they were talking about a guy like Gordon Ryan. And he was like, why would he give up what he has in the grappling world? He's waking, he's making way more money. He's yeah. way more famous and, yeah. and he has more notoriety to transition into MMA where he's certainly going to take a pay cut unless he ends up in the elite of MMA you guys, you're not, it's not, it's not sustainable and you get punched and kicked in the head. <laughs> yeah. That's a, uh, that's one of the, a uh, great thing right now though, is, is that jujitsu is now uh, a way that you can, you can make a living, you know, not too long ago, you couldn't do that. Right. Um, where they got pro jujitsu events where you actually, you actually get paid to go and compete. And they got these multiple events now where it's like a, like a pool, you put in a hundred bucks, but you have the chance to win like 800, you know, a thousand. So it's definitely cool to see guys doing uh, like pro jujitsu. As far as jujitsu guys transitioning into MMA, uh, they better start with a striking class or two. <laughs> That's for sure. And a, and a wrestling class. <laughs> yes. Yes. Cool. All right. We're going to take a quick break and I want to pick back up with that when we come back and talk about your trajectory and how, you know, you kind of got started in MMA and what that process is like. All right. So hang tight. Everybody will be back in just a few. All right, everybody. Welcome back. If you're just tuning in, it's the Entrepreneurial Web. I'm your host, Jeremiah Fox. Today, we are Zooming to Santee, California, where we're talking to Jeff, the administrator. Peterson! I'll go it's, a better, it's a better Bruce Buffer than the first one. I hesitated the first time. You know, it was like spontaneous. I was like, oh, I should like halfway through your name. I was like, I should be doing this like we're in the ring. And so I, I kind of feed. But by the last commercial, I'm going to kill it. You, you, kill might, it. you might have a future in, uh, in ring announcing. Who knows? <laughs> well, you think I'm doing this show, man? <laughs> that, I mean, so it's, it's that like you're you talking. What's that? I said, you hear that UFC? You yeah, yeah. Oh, you're right. <laughs> any, uh, any of you guys, I'll take it. You know, I'll take it. It's interesting because we were talking about like sources of in income through all this. Like I, I own a restaurant. I also have a, uh, another job with my business partner and hustle a couple of the little things on the side. But I was, I was also teaching, uh, you know, not full time, but I was teaching, you know, a solid like 10 classes a week you know, jujitsu, yeah, yeah. uh, Muay Thai and fitness out of the school that I've been at for the last five years. And, and, you know, I, it was, it was just random the way that it happened. I was just training again. I was there all the time. I was taking like 20 classes a week. My kids started training there and I was like, you know, it's like the, the soccer dad on the sidelines, like, Hey, grab the arm, do this. Right. And they were finally like, do you want to, do you want to come on the mat for the kids class? And I was like, Sure. Like I always had a gi, so I hopped on. No, no, you want to teach kids class? I was like, all right. And then it just snowballed. And I ended up yep. teaching a lot, you know, and, and I really enjoyed it. I didn't do it for money, but I started to make good money at it too. Wow. And I was like, this is nice. I really like this. 
and then everything got shut down. <laughs> so I've lost that income. And, and I don't know what it's like there, but here, like the, some striking schools have opened back up, but only like the really big ones, not like there's not like the little local, you know, kind of striking school or, or a fitness center that's opened up because the requirements are just so steep here in New York City. What's the vibe like? Uh, what's it? Give us the, the street level scene in uh, in San Diego. What's happening there with gyms? Are you all able to train? Are you able to do jujitsu and like touch each other? And yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's surprising how many gyms stayed open through all of this. Like nice. There's definitely quite a few that early on, like right in the beginning of the shutdown, where they had to close and they could just never reopen or they weren't comfortable reopening for whatever reason. But mm -hmm. surprisingly, there was a lot of gyms that that stayed open and, and survived all the madness. But our gym and quite a few other gyms are we're just op open and operating as if there is no pandemic. You know? And I think that's why I think that's why people want to go to the gym. You know, they most people that do jujitsu were already in the mindset of like, they're like, I go to the gym and grab on to people and sweat on people and already like what are we supposed to do there's no there's no safe way safe yeah. way to do to do jujitsu you know right so uh it's probably like here like everywhere else uh everyone's wearing masks at restaurants and in the bank and there's lines and six feet distance and all that stuff but the few gyms that are that are still open through all this time i think we really provide a place where where people can come in and feel kind of normal you know yeah well, that's, I mean, in the hospitality industry, it's much the same. Um, you know, it was really difficult for my restaurant, but it was all about just providing that, that little sense of normalcy for people. Yeah. And that's what kept us in business. It wasn't, you know, I mean, we make good food, but it wasn't, it wasn't just that. It was like, oh, this is my release. Like we had things, we didn't change anything. We just kept going, you know, we had to go to takeout only for a little while, which is not awesome, but still that's what, you know, it just gave people that sense of normalcy. You know, in terms of, I mean, no, nothing has opened up in terms of jujitsu around here. There's a few schools that are doing dummy work, you know, but yep, yep. the rest of us, we're just, we never stopped, but we just had to take it, you know, off the grid. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, and that was, that, that's kind of what we did and what a few places did. We just stopped, stopped advertising, I guess, that we were open and we just kept it. We made our facility more of like a, a private members only mm. place, you know, and that, that was what we did originally while while everything was still I, I don't know I guess more everyone was still freaking out we yeah. just everything on a one-on-one -on -one basis like you can schedule and come in and train with the coach but one-on-one -on -one and we had it, it was crazy because we had like as soon as as soon as people started figuring out that they could come to the gym it was like it was just a domino effect before you knew it we were like uh we can't do private lessons anymore we got to just start doing classes again because everyone just wanted that, that, that release from all the, all the tension and all the, the quarantine sitting home all the time. So this place yeah. has definitely been uh, a stress reliever for a lot of people. That's for sure. Same, same. I mean, if I hadn't, I'm back to training like four days a week now, not, not seven the way it was, but man, I need it. I need it yeah. so, so bad. I mean, I, I listen to uh, Joe Rogan from time to time and he's always talking about just that, that daily kind of explosive uh, physical movement that you need, especially like if you're in business, you know, if you got a job and you got a family and just, just like life stress, like you have to hit that. You have to hit that at least once a day. I don't get to do jujitsu every day, but I find, you know, some workout every day, some kind of movement where, like I went to the park this morning. It's like 70 degrees in Brooklyn today. It's amazing. I was in a tank top and shorts. Yeah, so awesome. And uh, and I, I hopped onto just the monkey bars in the park. You know, they have those outdoor workout stations. And I just went until like I was dizzy. And I was like, okay, time to go do the show now. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's great that you were, they were able to provide that service and, and keep that going. Um, and then in terms of, you know, what we were talking about before in terms of, you know you as a as a martial artist like exclusively like you were saying there's guys that have like evening jobs they're like fighters during the day like george st pierre was like a garbage man you know in his early days 
but you managed to etch out this this uh, this little world for yourself where you're, you're exclusively working out of the gym. So you're the head instructor at, I got it written down here, Alliance Training Center East in Santine, California. <laughs> That's right. Um, and you've got this, you've got this sports nutrition certification. So you're working as a head instructor at a martial arts academy, but also working uh, privately with people. And then you're working in the professional fighting scene. But as you were saying, it doesn't always offer that much money when you actually do the fights, especially at the level that you're working at now. Um, yeah. I know you mentioned that you're interested, you know, you're pursuing, um, you know, admitted into the UFC, but you're working in, a, in some smaller uh, organizations now. What are some of the organizations you've been working with in terms of the fight promotions lately? Uh, the last three shows I fought for, uh, I fought for Bellator, nice. uh, King of the Cage, and LFA. Those nice. Were, those are all kind of bigger, bigger stages for sure. Prior to that, I were, I was with a bunch of small shows, like just different, different local promotions, just like, you know, fighting in, fighting behind bars, <laughs> fighting under canopies. Uh, but what was the place in uh, uh, Pennsylvania? What, what? I can't, I can't even remember the name of the town in Pennsylvania, but no, but the venue, it was like a, a roller skating rink or something like that. It was, yeah, it, it was literally a roller skating rink. It was like they had like a tiny little arcade off to the side. And then it was a big roller skating rink. And they just put a cage in there and put some tables down. I mean, that's how that's how the shows do it. If there's room wow. for a cage and there's room for chairs and tables. I have a fight. But yeah, that was out in the middle of, middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah. And so now, like we were talking about on the last segment, um, you know, what the jujitsu promotions are doing, um, especially following like, like the EBI events, you know, where announcer, I've even seen Bruce Buffer call some of the, uh, introduce some of the jujitsu only matches, you know, and um, I, maybe it was Metamoris or something like that. It was something out of California. Um, but you know, smoke machines, lights, like the big music, yeah. the dudes roll in. It, it's it's like a big promotion, like, and yeah, that's helped like a fight. Yeah, yeah, it's helped. It's helped that uh, you know that little niche of the fight scene, um, and it's less dangerous for the fighters. And in in some cases, they're making even well, more you, money. You tap early. <laughs> you tap early. Yeah. Right. I mean, some people get jacked from time to time, but uh. uh you know, I mentioned Gordon Ryan earlier. He did one a big one last year and tore his LCL, which is not the worst of the uh, the knee tears. He was able to get back pretty quickly, but like just in transition, working with bigger guys, you know, a foot, a knee, you know, wasn't catastrophic, fortunately for his career. But um, but yeah, he was basically talked out of doing like going into mixed martial arts because of the risk involved. Um, so what were some of the things that, uh, you know, as you were heading into this or that you learned maybe along the way in terms of, obviously there's, there's getting knocked out. That's never great. Um, what are some of the other risks? Like just, cause this, it's, there's a small percentage of the population doing what you do. So like, yeah, what was, what was the thought process like going into that? Cause like most people would just turn away and I really, what I want to highlight through, through the course of the show is like, everybody's got these, ma you know, just these massive kind of uh, mountains in front of them. And people are kind of like, I don't know what to do. There's the fear factor. You have to push all that aside to even just step foot in the ring. It's just, I can't even imagine. What, what, were, what were some of the, the things that went through your head and things you had to overcome to do that? Man, uh, <laughs> they, they say fights are won in the gym, you know? Fights mm -hmm. are won by, by your preparation. Uh, my first, my first couple fights, uh, were definitely, man, I can't even describe how I felt. My coach told me in my, my very first fight, this is, uh, I was 18 when I did my first fight. I just turned 18, like three weeks prior. I graduated high school early. I cut my, I was in wrestling and it was, you know, towards the end of the season. And I actually cut my wrestling season short and started training for my first MMA fight. And Man, I think my coach, <laughs> my coach probably hyped me up so much that that's why I believed in myself at the time. He's like, you can do this. You're, you're a beast. Like, just go, just go mess somebody up. And I, and I believed it. I was like, all right, yeah, I'm going to do it, you know? And 
after that first round, uh, it, it was crazy. I went in there. I was the first fight of the night on a really big show. The, the fight was in Green Bay, uh, Wisconsin, and it mm-hmm. was across the street from the Packers Dome. I can't, across the street from Lambeau Bay, where Lambeau Bay used to be anyways. I cannot remember the name. I'm not a big football guy, so I cannot remember the name of the dude. But he was the main event, and he was uh, a former Packer. So it was it was a huge deal. There was, like, thousands of people in the stands. I was the very first fight, walked out, and it was just fear, shock. It's almost like, almost like you're just purely in shock, like, what am I doing right now? Why, why did I choose to do this? And I, I probably maintained that expression the whole first round. My my corner telling me stuff. My eyes are wide. He said I was pale in the face. I was probably about to throw up. But it's crazy how much uh, how much you can you can pull out of yourself when someone's punching you in the face. And <laughs> that, that was one of the things I, I realized early on is that when I just let I just let instinct take over that that human instinct of it's fight or flight it's fight or flight that's that's always what it comes down to to me in a fight and my reaction is never flight it's always been fight especially when it's when it when it comes to you know physical physical altercation yeah yeah cool if we're, uh, if we're just if someone was just yelling at me i might flight i might be like push those bad vibes aside but yeah <laughs> when i've heard a lot of fighters say they would avoid it, in almost all cases any kind of like street confrontation oh yeah and only definitely. and only pull up the pull up the fist if they absolutely had to the few times i've been in like street altercations or stuff outside of the gym that's it, it literally is the same feeling you have when you're about to get in a real like a mma fight that adrenaline dump you start getting mm-hmm. sweaty mouth gets dry yeah but yeah my very first fight i i I got beat up in the first round and then I ended up coming back, coming back and submitting him in the second round. Nice. And then then just goes on from there. I started, I just started fighting as much as I could. My coach, my coach was booking me fights in advance. And I I did a lot early on Um, in like four or five months. I did seven fights when I first started, which is on. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah it's, it's unheard of now. I was doing two fights a month, some months. Yeah, that's and then uh, right after that little stint of fights, um, I was already enlisted to go into the go into the Marine Corps. So I rattled off all these fights, and then I and then I shipped off to boot camp. Yeah, cool. Well, we're gonna ship off to our second break and come back for round three. Ding, ding, ding. We'll be back in just a few. Everybody, hang tight. All right, folks, welcome back. If you're just tuning in, we're talking here with Jeff, the administrator, Peterson, out of Santee, California. What what do you administer? <laughs> Jeff, <that's... laughs> Ass whoopings. Ass whoopings. I had a feeling you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Uh, I don't, I, I probably type maybe 20 words a minute, so <laughs> I'm, not I'm not that good at that kind of administrating. <laughs> yeah. I figured I figured you were you were going to come back with that. Um, so I'm curious how you ended up uh, as a head instructor at Alliance. I mean, I'm sure your 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 fighting record and just participation had something to do with that. What was what was kind of the you have, you've had a meandering journey around the country in the Marines. How did you end up in California and as a head instructor, this fine academy? So or before I even went in the military, I, I knew I wanted to do something. As soon as I found martial arts and I found it as a, as an outlet for me, I knew it was something that I, that I wanted to do. You know, in high school, they're always asking, Oh, what do you want to go to college for? What do you want to go to college for this and that? And in my head, I was like, I don't have money to go to college. So I'm going to join the military and, and, you know, use that as my route to go to college. But in my head, I, I wanted to do something with fitness and martial arts of some of some sort um so the way i ended up in california was i was about to make my pro debut i had done done some fights in wisconsin fought out in virginia and then i was getting ready to turn pro and one of my uh one of my good friends in virginia matt van buren um he came out to alliance already he came up uh to alliance mma and chula vista and was training out there and he and he told me said hey you know you should come out here and train uh get ready for your first pro fight 
So I bought a plane ticket. I was planning to, this is after I was out of the Marine Corps. I just got out of the Marine Corps. Bought a plane ticket. I was planning to stay for two weeks and then come back. And uh, so I went, went to Alliance in Chula Vista. Uh, I stayed at the gym. They had like, I wouldn't call them dorms. They just had an upstairs full of air mattresses, you know. So I stayed up there and my fight, I had a fight booked in Virginia. It ended up getting canceled. So I just, I just didn't hop on that return flight. I just stayed and I said, you know what, I'm just going to stay here until, until something happens till I get a fight. Ended up getting a fight, went out to, went back to Virginia, did my first pro fight. Jacob actually cornered me for that fight. Um, from there, from there, uh, after I trained in California, I was there for two months living at the gym. I knew that's where I wanted to be. It was Alliance MMA was, was in its heyday right at, right at that point in 2011, 2012, 2013. We had a lot of guys, a lot of big names training out of there. Uh, all the guys were fresh out of the season from the Ultimate Fighter. There was uh, Justin Lawrence, Miles Jury, and then, of course, Dominic Cruz just, just coached that season, the Ultimate Fighter. He's, he's at Alliance. And then Brandon Vera's there. Jeremy Stevens is there. Just a big who's who of, of MMA guys were there around my weight class. I knew that's where I wanted to be. So I didn't have any money. I was broke because the Marine Corps paid me better than civilian life at the time. So I didn't quite know how to manage my, manage my income, not getting paid on the first and 15th every month. Yeah. So, uh, my dad got me a job, uh, in Wisconsin. He goes, Hey, I called him. I'm like, dad, I'm broke. <laughs> He's like, uh, it, it was like a Thursday. He goes, can you be, can you be in Wisconsin on Monday? <laughs> I said, all right. Packed up my stuff, went back and I did road construction for a few months until I got laid off, saved up a bunch of money. And then moved to California, uh, enrolled myself in college. And, and that helped me out uh, while I was in college, you know, the military, you get BAH. So that, that schooling in the military funded me be, being in California originally. So while I was getting, while I was in school, I also started doing my nutrition certification on the side. And then that was when I, I came over to Alliance East, which is like the, the sister gym of, uh, Alliance Chula Vista is just a little bit smaller. It's in, it's in East County. It's a little more country in East County and that I felt a little more at home in, in East County. So I pretty much, <laughs> the way I got to where I am now is I was just consistent, persistent, and I, I pretty much outlasted everybody. Um, as far as the staff goes, it was when I came to Alliance East, I, I just said, I'll, I will work any position I can. If someone needs a class covered or someone can't make it to teach, I'll teach that class. And we, uh, they needed a salesperson at the time. I was like, I haven't done sales ever in my life. I'm a freaking Marine, Marine fighter. So next thing you know, that's the job that opened up. And I was like, so this is the job that means I got to be at the gym every day. I'll take it. <laughs> so meathead cauliflower your fighter is making phone calls every day trying to trying to get people into the gym and uh i ended up doing that position for way longer than i wanted to pretty much just because i was really responsible and on time <laughs> and and just kind of knew what needed to be done and before you know it more and more coaches they would find a different job or they just wanted to do something else they needed more a better income so all these guys are falling off and all these classes are opening up and I just kind of started started teaching for all the guys that were leaving and it was uh just consistency persistency and being reliable and and working hard uh, before you know it I'm teaching most of the classes yeah and that's true of all things right that's like if you want to be a professional fighter it's not yeah. about riding in on a comet some guys come in that way but like for the majority of us it's consistency persistence showing up every day and you said it earlier and i thought this was really profound is is you know you're a product of your training it's it's yeah. the work in the gym so when you walk into that arena and there's thousands of people you know, your butthole feels like it's about that big, <laughs> you know, it's, it's your, it's your, it's your habits yep. that show up uh, because your brain is like, ah, you know, it's like dysfunctional at the time. But if you've trained like 
the message, like the, the quote in your, your Instagram uh, bio, you train the jab 10,000 times, like it's going to be there. Yep. And uh, I think that's a big takeaway for people, no matter what they want to do, no matter what they want to progress in, but right now, especially, you know, I think the time and, and hopefully this is true. You know, you said you were providing this great service during the pandemic for people that really were like in it already, you know, it was like me, I hit, I hit jujitsu culture and there's no turning back. There was it, like not training was not an option. It was just like, no, we're going to, we're going to figure this out some way. Some people that I trained with, they were like my training partners for like five years. They're just like, they're doing something else right now. I'm like, cool. Don't worry. We'll be, we'll be here when you come back. But yep. I think a lot of people are going to need this in a major way once things really loosen up, especially because of the amount of, uh, I'm involved in alcohol sales here in New York City. And uh, oh, yeah. by, by the, <laughs> like record alcohol sales, they're gonna need to work yep. that shit off <laughs> when things open oh, yeah. back up. And, uh, yeah. and, and that's the message for that too. You know, it's like, okay, if you wanna get back to like good health, maybe you were in good health, maybe you had good habits prior to the pandemic and, and you got rocked, you know, you got knocked off the horse a little bit. It's, it's about, just showing up, just come in every day, you know, just chip a little way. Uh, you know, my professor used to say this all the time. If you want to take a tree down, don't think about coming down and getting it done in one day. You know, if you've got the big machinery, you can, but if it's just you and this big tree, five hacks a day, just walk out and hit that tree five times a day. And eventually you're going to, you're going to take enough away and it's just going to fall on its own inertia. Yep. And that's, uh, what I'm telling my guys all the time, all the, all the guys that are, that are ambitious, uh, hopefuls to, to go professional one day is, uh, I'm telling them that it starts now. It's not just, it's not just talent and ability. It's, it's a crazy drive. It's a crazy mindset that, that you have where, you know, even on the days you don't want to, even when you're tired, when you're worn out, you're sore, you're getting beat up, you have to just show up. Even, even if you can't, if you can't give it your hundred percent, at least show up, you know, show up and put the work in. And, uh, that was, that was really the, the biggest difference of me and everyone else who I guess didn't, uh, didn't last. <laughs> I just well, like showed, up, showed up every day, showed up every yeah. day. What, what's everybody need? What's going on? How do I, how do I keep this gym going? Right. It's like the old, uh, you know, the old black belt saying the black belt is just a white belt who never quit. Like you start with how many people did you start jujitsu with that no longer train, you know? Oh, yeah. It's like yeah. so many of them. And everybody kind of was on, especially, you know, in the honeymoon phase of jujitsu, where like when you first get into it and you're just like, oh, this is the best thing ever. And you're riding high. And then maybe you get your blue belt and you're like two years into your blue belt and you're like, what, what am I doing? You know, I never went through that, but I've heard about it. For me, it's just been like, just go every day. I don't care. You could get rid of the belt system. I care not. I'm here for, for a different reason. Um, but you just start to see people fall off uh, because of that, you know, whatever that, that, that drive, you have to recreate it a lot of times, right? You got to figure out a new way to, to get yourself in there. Like you yeah. said, even if you're, even if you're not feeling your best, you just come in and, and I, you know, there's the old like Japanese tale of how the black belt evolved. They all just had white belts and yeah. they, they, they just got turned like the guys that did it for like 10, 20 years. This is just black by the end. And they were like, that, that's, that's, that's when you know the guy is the man because his belt is just so dirty. It's black. He's done it. He's done his reps 10,000 times. He will fuck you up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're gonna take one more quick break. We'll be back in just a few, everybody. Hang tight. Welcome back, everybody. Once again, we're talking with Jeff, the administrator, Peterson. I told you the last hey. one was gonna be good. <laughs> that was pretty good. I got, I got, I got the, I got the itch. <laughs> so you know, again, going back to the the little pop up show that Jacob and I are doing, just talking about, you know talking about business and, and fighting and martial arts and just all things similar to what we're doing today, just trying to be motivational for people because for, for both of us and for yourself, it's been that springboard, you know, for motivation, for daily motivation. Like the same with the restaurant scene around here, all these places closed down. Boom, 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 boom. Gyms, restaurants, everything. And it's just like the people that stick it out. Yeah, it sucks. 
<laughs> this is sucks. Mm-hmm. It's been a rough fucking year. I haven't had a day off since February. I've worked all day, every day, but I still train. I made no excuses. I haven't cried. Yep. You know, yep. we haven't gotten any loans or anything. Just work yep. with what we had. But it's about, it's just about right. lasting because mm-hmm. one day it'll, it'll, something better will be there. You know, there'll be like other opportunities and the people that have been there doing it, those are the ones that are going to have the edge, just like training. Like I tell, I see my training partners and those old guys, you know, the guys I used to train with, I see them all the time. And I'm like, you're going to watch your back because when you come back, you're not going to be the same dude yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as when you left and you're not going to be the same either. No. I get you. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the interview that, that uh, Askren and Danaher were, were doing together, they were talking about that, how there's going to be a lot more opportunities going forward because of uh, the grappling, you know, the grappling uh, promotions that are happening. There's, you're seeing more dedicated podcasts specifically mm-hmm. to just like the grappling world, like flow grappling. Those guys started with like two guys in the back of a van, you know, driving around yeah. and now they're like, they're a media company, you know? So yeah. I'm practicing, you know, Jacob and I were working on it. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to be announcers. <laughs> That'd be cool. That'd be cool. I, I, I've listened. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so I wanted to also, I wanted to hear your take, you know, uh, we talked about how you got, how you became the head instructor, kind mm-hmm. of like the mentality going into, uh, like an actual MMA fight, which like, le- you know, far less than a fraction of the percent of the population has ever done. Um, what from your, your training in the Marine Corps, like I've got a few really close friends that are Marine Corps. Most of them ended up ironically, uh, as FDNY firefighters, um, but uh, a, a few good friends and they still, some of them still do like retreats and everything like that. And the, the fortitude of these dudes, man, it's like unparalleled. How did, how did your training in military prep you for like entering fights for living, you know, out of a gym and having no money and bouncing around the country, but just like keeping your, your sights kind of set and getting yourself to where you're at now. Um. Man, the mili- like the biggest word you could give, especially at the Marine Corps, is just it, discipline. Just straight discipline. No, you, you know what the task is and you know what you have to do. And there's no room for there's no room for hesitation. There's no room for for whining, for being uncomfortable. It, you just charge straight ahead, straight ahead to what you want. Yeah. Um, I, I have to do, I've known for a long time what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be an instructor. I knew I wanted to be in fitness. I knew I wanted to be in martial arts and I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I can't like, I can't imagine having, having a regular job that I don't like. Cause all, all I would be thinking about is, is this, I'd be thinking, when is the next time I can get to the gym? Um, and then the Marine Corps pretty much just, it just gave me that, that discipline and that drive and, gave me that the confidence to know no matter how uncomfortable you get, no matter what the circumstances are, as long as you, you keep that, that end goal in mind and you make sure you will do nothing, nothing can stop you. Nothing will stand in your way. Then you can, you can get everything you want. Yeah. It's nice. Um, I, some business personalities that I listen to, they say the same thing. They're just like, get the blinders on. Yep. Like do what you have to do. Go move back in with your parents. Like, yep. if this is what you want, if you want to build your own business, just get rid of all the bullshit. You don't need the fancy car. You don't need the house with, you know, a two car garage and, and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Just like, if you really want this, you get the blinders on and you just make all sacrifices to make it happen. So you've done that physically. <laughs> yeah. Also, you've also done that, uh, you know, from a, from a monetary standpoint, from a financial standpoint with the gym, by just like you said earlier, sticking it out and just taking, taking, you know, I, I'm curious, did you, did you, when you got the sales position, did you call Jacob? Cause he's the same way, just like a gnarly dude with cauliflower ear, but he's like, he's a freaking hustler. <laughs> yeah, J- Jacob's a, a better talker than I am. That's for sure. Uh, he's yeah. a better talker than I am. I'm just like, God, yeah. I thought I was okay, man. And then like, he started doing this show with me and I'm like, fuck. Yeah, man. Talk about a guy that could sell anyone anything. Seriously, seriously. <laughs> it's in our DNA, though. Like when he came on the show, that's what we talked about. And just like our grandfather, our mother's father, and he was the same way. And he, it's funny because it just like skipped over my sister. 
because she doesn't talk to anybody. She's just like, yeah. you know, she, she's quiet as a mouse. Um, and our dad too. I mean, have you met, you must know guns. Yep, yep, yep. I've you stayed know. right at his house once. Yeah, I mean, the dude barely says anything, you know? And even when he does, he takes his time, you know? You ask him a question and he's like, <laughs> you know? But yep. Jacob and I just can't, can't shut the fuck up. I got no cauliflower here though. I don't yeah. know, for whatever reason, I've, I've grappled almost every day for the last five years and just yeah, never I got it. Shoot some, shoot some hard doubles into some hips, you know? Yeah. I, the ghee, the ghee gets my ears bad, but I never get the, um, I never get the cauliflower. Um, but you know, you ever get, yeah, you get that ear bar where you're like, you want to tap because it feels like <laughs> I get gi burn because I just, I wrestle all the time. So I'm pushing into people with my yeah. face. Every gi class I come off, I just got gi burn under my eyes. Yeah, no, I get it too. I get it all over my forehead. And my wife will be like, did you get hit? And I'm like, no, just, just, uh, just rug burn. nothing but lapel chokes yesterday. And I had my, I had my nice uh, jujitsu hickey. It was yeah. the best. We, we did like 200 chokes yesterday. We're like, oh my God. So we're going to have to wrap it up here. I know you got to teach a class too. What, uh, what, what right. class are you about to teach? Uh, I'm about to do kickboxing. It's nice. a, yeah, it's an all levels kickboxing class. I got a, a, a good group of uh, studs here in the morning. So nice. Is, uh, really, yeah. And it's what? It's, it's almost uh, 10 o'clock your time. Yep. Yep. So they're, they're just for the most part starting their day. And, and this is just a good thing for them to do. Get break a sweat, hang out, crack some jokes. I can try to make them throw up and then, yep. <laughs> and then they can go on with their day. <laughs> it was I was doing the same I taught I taught kickboxing 10 a.m Tuesday Thursday and Saturday for like three years and yeah. that was it it was like you're gonna start your day well you might throw up but we're gonna we're gonna bang this out and uh yeah. it was awesome last message I want you to close the show what do you got for everybody just a one-liner that that's helped you what do you tell yourself all the time that folks can can repeat to get over those peaks a one-liner to myself Ooh, from myself. Mm -hmm. what do <laughs> Don't be a pussy. Boom. <laughs> whatever, whatever thing is that you're not doing, that little bit of fear, just push it aside. Just do it. If I ever get to announce you in a fight, I'm gonna quote that. I'm gonna be like, Jeff, the administrator. Don't be a pussy, Peterson. Amazing, awesome man. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Have a great class. Work those guys extra hard for me today. Say, so this is coming from Brooklyn. You guys have got to do 10 extra burpees. I want somebody to throw up. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks for having me on the show. Uh, have a good day. You too. All right, everybody. Thank you. We'll check in with you next week. Have a great weekend. Peace out. Woo, woo.